The American Forum of the Air will be heard 30 minutes from now over many of these same stations. Sholton, makers of Old Spice aftershave lotion, for that top of the world feeling after every shave, bring you top of the world in action drama for men. I adventure. Adventure. With Sunday's primetime readings all but lost, NBC turned their attention to Sunday afternoons. They acquired High Adventure from the Mutual Broadcasting System and debuted it with Flight to Renar on January 29, 1950. The show was geared towards men with a deep-voiced narrator sketching the story in a few sentences. It was set at the High Adventure Society where people told tales of hard action, hard men, and smooth this is women. This your host, and this is High Adventure. Or, to be precise and practical, the weekly meeting of the High Adventure Society, whose members are those of you, wherever you are, who like stories of strong men, smooth women, and hard, fast action. Hmm. If I said it more convincing, I'd get excited myself. <clears throat> anyway, meeting's in order, and on the agenda is Flight to Reynard, an aviation story of the new fighting the old, with a beautiful woman in the winner's circle. Flight to Reynard, written and directed for the Society by Bob Monroe, Another story of high adventure. It's funny how many different ideas there are about flying. I guess most people think a pilot on an airliner has an exciting, thrilling job. Well, you'd be surprised how boring long hops can be to the guy up front. Or how much hard work there can be when there's hard work to be done. To me, flying was just a business, no more. So I guess it was just plain boredom and the desire to make a few dollars that made me take the offer to ferry a ship south. I was waiting for assignment to the foreign schedule, so I had a month to spare, and that's how I happened to be landing a C-47 solo on a strip outside of Diablo in the wilder part of South America. Oh, what a dump. Hey! Hey, you! Yeah? This for Diablo? I hope so. If it ain't, they've been full of me, too. Oh, why, boy? Where you been? Huh? Come by way of Hawaii, maybe? Sure, why not? I like flying twin engine without a co-pilot. We had an ETA on you for yesterday. Well, it happens, mister. I had to wait out a front in Caracas. Bad weather, huh? Okay. And I think I did pretty good on dead reckoning. Hit this spot right on the nose with no fixes, no navigator, no range station. We got a range station. Well, how was I to know? It's not on the chart. Okay. Don't even have the name of the joint painted on the roof. Okay, okay, okay. Where's Conway Airlines? You're looking a part of it. I'm supposed to deliver to T.W. Conway of Conway Airlines. After that, show me some food and I'll be ready to get back to civilization. Okay. Well, where's T.W. Conway? There he is. Where? Up there. In the AT-6? Yeah. A uh, crazy flathead. Huh? It's coming right at us. Yeah. Buzz job. Yeah. Well, watch it. Huh? Down. Well, that's fine. What you so worried about? I suppose that's his idea of a welcoming committee. Come on, I'll show you the office. Speed will roll right up to the front door. He always does. Somebody ought to teach him what you can and can't do with an airplane. Somebody ought to teach Speed Conway? <laughs> Speed Conway? Yeah. Familiar name. He was flying before you was walking. Oh. Well, nice landing. Never misses that speed. Speed Conway. The race pilot? Yeah. Well, so the ten goose finally came in, huh? Hello, boy. Thanks for bringing it down. I got paid in advance. Are you T.W. Conway? Sure. Well, here's your invoice. One beat-up C-47. Now, is there a place I can get something to eat, and after that, will you tell me the best way to get to Santiago? I already got my ticket back, so if you... <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. You just got here. What's the hurry? Well, I have to go... Come on in the office. Marie will sign the receipt for you. She's the one that keeps the books. After that, we'll go to the best foodery this side of Panama. Come on, boy. The goose finally got here, honey. I saw it land. It's beautiful. The boy here set her down right on the edge. A perfect stall landing. So now you can meet a good pilot. Oh, excuse me, I don't even know what you call yourself. Breslin, Fred Breslin. Well, Freddy, meet the best and swellest gal ever to hang around an airport. I had to put Maria here to work to keep her out of the airplanes. Hello, Freddy. Maria. Now, Freddy's hungry, and we got something to celebrate, so let's close up shop and have some fun. What are we celebrating this time? We're in business again. Conway Airlines now owns a ten goose. Okay, Freddy. What? You'll feel better after you come over to get some of Papi's roast beef. You coming, boy? We'll have to get washed up. You should go with speed. Your face is very dirty. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd better. 
A dinner. A little wine, Freddy? Thanks. Go ahead and help yourself first. <laughs> I never drink when I'm eating. Or at any other time? Well, you feel better, Fred? You're right about that roast beef. Oh, you didn't answer my question. You feel better? I feel fine. Not going to bite our heads off anymore? <laughs> Don't tease him, Speed. He'd just come in from a long flight. Well, that shouldn't bother him. Look at all the beautiful scenery he had to look at. Trouble is, you're too busy to have a chance to see it. Why, that's half the fun of flying. Getting up there, looking over the top of a mountain, seeing as far as you can see... Yeah, boy, that's half the fun. If you call it fun. <laughs> Listen to him, Maria. Wisdom of youth. A lot of work to fly in. If by work you mean money, you tell me where it is. I gave up trying to make my first million with airplanes. Thought maybe I better have better luck with my second. But all I get is red ink, huh, honey? <laughs> Too much of it. Now sit still, I'll be back. I want to tell Papy we liked his roast beef. We're glad you brought the goose, boy. Now maybe I can make that second million for it. I adventure would run on NBC until October 8th, 1950. Like my name. It returned to Mutual on January 13, 1953, before leaving the airways for good on September 21, 1954. I have lived here all my life. You speak English very well. I studied with tutors. Oh. And speed completed my vocabulary. I can imagine. Maria. Yes? I... You like the music? It is always very soothing. Care to dance? I'm sorry. Why? I always dance first with speed. I see. Well, I got the music going. That's fine. Ah, it's a wonderful night. Big full moon, good food. Just a night to fly across to... Hey, Freddy, uh, come on. I want to show you something. Sure. We'll be right back, honey. I will wait. Give you to dance. <laughs> I didn't forget. Out here, Freddy. I brought you out because... You being a pilot, I figured you could appreciate it better than anybody else. Appreciate what? I was hoping you might trace your career. You were a drama student, and they didn't teach radio drama in, in those days any more than they taught television drama, uh, say, back in 1938 or something like that. So what were the, the events that led you into radio then after uh, having graduated from Yale? I was broke. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have told us that. You know, there wasn't that, uh, any place to go. I had been a picture writer of, of very, very little success in Hollywood. Then the president closed the banks, President Roosevelt, just after his inauguration in 1933. I went to a party at a friend's house, and uh, a fellow I just met says, I understand you're a writer. I said, yeah, I'm a writer. He said, what can you write? I said, anything. <laughs> That's what you say when you're hungry. <laughs> That's right. And he said, can you write radio? I said, sure. <laughs> I didn't tell him I had nothing but a contempt for radio because I was a picture writer. So we'll go see this fellow down. So I went downtown, met this fellow. This fellow had a derby hat on. His name was Don Lee, and he owned the Cadillac distributorship in California. And he also owned KFRC San Francisco, KHJ Los Angeles, and a whole string up the valley. Yeah, Don Lee Network. I remember Don that. Lee Network. Yeah, right. <laughs> And he took me to lunch at a health food restaurant with Smiley Wiley, his sales manager, always Carnation Wiley, we call him. Always wore Carnation in his buttonhole. And he said, young man, uh, what can you offer to radio? And I said, well, I think I just finished this assignment at Universal Studios. I said, well, I think a dramatization of World War Flyers. I almost said World War I, but they didn't say that in those days. <laughs> yeah. World War Flyers. I think that'd be, there's Frank Luke the Balloon Buster, there's von Richthof, and there's uh, oh, so many of them, uh, and all the boys in the Lafayette Escadron. I'm just off the top of the head. And he said, that sounds very interesting. You want to come in tomorrow and start writing? See if we like you and you like us? And I said, sure. So I went in with the brashness of 26 and 7 years old and uh, uh, wrote it, and it was on the air. I never knew how much money I was being paid until I got a check, and I found out it was forty-six fifty a week. In January of 1950, NBC canceled Hollywood Calling and replaced it with a new series produced and directed by radio legend William N. Robeson. The Adventures of Christopher London took to the air on January 22nd at 7 p.m., opposite Jack Benny on CBS. It was written by Earl Stanley Gardner of Perry Mason fame and starred Glenn Ford. London was a globe-trotting investigator who tackled a weekly excursion against crime. 
the National Broadcasting Company presents Christopher London, created especially for radio by the most widely read mystery story writer in the world, Earl Stanley Gardner, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and starring Mr. Glenn Ford. <laughs> I am Christopher London, private investigator and sometimes student of the teachings of the Orient. In the faraway monastery of the moon of yesterday in the hills of western China, I learned many things. I like to think that one of them was tolerance, but I find it hard hard to be tolerant of greed and murder. Yet any man who agrees to look for a beautiful missing heiress along the San Francisco waterfront is asking for trouble. And usually he gets it. In this case, it was me, and I got it. It started in the lavish Knob Hill home of Arthur J. Manners, attorney at law, where I had been invited on a professional basis. Fix up your drink, London? No, thanks. I asked you to come here because I didn't want to talk about this thing at the office. That's a nice place you have here. Awfully nice. Oh, it's too big. Too expensive. Now, first I'd better show you the young lady's picture. Hmm. To Arthur, my dear friend and guardian, Helen. Oh, she's a beautiful girl, Mr. Manners. Ah, too beautiful. Too rich, too spoiled. From the time her parents died five years ago, Helen Falconer has been a constant worry to me. And now this. This time I'm really worried. Now, let's see. He said a week ago she arrived on the plane from Mexico. Yes, for her first visit in more than a year. She wired me when to expect her, and she was on the plane. I checked. I found somebody who remembers seeing her get into a dark blue sedan. And that's all, London. She's disappeared, vanished. And just when I have to produce her in court next week for an accounting of my guardianship. What about relatives, friends? No living relatives and no friends in San Francisco. She's never here for more than a few days at a time. Doesn't live anywhere for more than a couple of months at a time. The French Riviera, Rio, New York, Acapulco. Only time I know where she is is when she wires me for money. Well, you've checked the hospitals, I suppose, in the morgue. Certainly. Why haven't you gone to the police? Afraid to. That's why you're here. Uh, where did I put that? Uh, oh, here, you better take this. Uh, driver's license. Yeah, she applied for it last time she was here. Age, height, hair, eyes, and so on. Thumbprint, signature. Might help. It might indeed. You'll know her by a ring she wears. She never takes it off. Antique emerald ring. Heavy gold setting. Stone engraved with a serpent and an arrow. Find that ring and you'll know who it is even if she has her head in a sack. Yes, come in. There's a Mr. Lawrence Scoville. Oh, tell him to go away. I'm busy. I said I'd call him if I heard anything. Yes, sir. Oh, Scoville. I should have told you about him, London. Claims he's engaged to Helen. Met her recently in New York. Well, maybe, maybe not. Says she wired him she was coming and to meet her here in San Francisco. Spends his days mooning around my office. I wish he'd go back to New York. He gets on my nerves. Well, maybe I'd better start by seeing him. No. Yes, just a waste of time. He doesn't know a thing. You interest me, Mr. Manners. Have you changed your mind about wanting me to locate this girl? Changed my mind? No. Why? Because you're stalling. I... Yes, I suppose I am. But it's because I'm worried. I don't know how much I should confide in anybody. In that case, we're both wasting our time. Goodbye, Mr. Manners. Now, wait. No, London, sit down. Please. All right. I have reason to believe that Helen has involved herself in some sort of a smuggling operation. For the thrill of it, nothing more. That may be that the headquarters of this gang is at a waterfront dive named El Toro or El Torero, something of the sort. Mind you, I don't say it's true, but it, it may be true. Now, you must have some reason for believing it. Well, I'm not at liberty to give my reasons. I, I merely warn you that searching for her may lead you into some danger. Well, in a way, Mr. Manor's danger is my business. I'll keep in touch with you. Well, now, I'll say this. Nobody ever began a search for a missing girl with more clues. A waterfront dive named El Toro. El Torero or something of the sort. Well, it wasn't in the phone book, but I thought I knew how to find it. You take a stroll along the Embarcadero in the fog and you might find anything. I'm sorry. It's okay. I didn't hurt you, did I? No. This fog is pretty thick, isn't it? What's the matter? You lost? Well, in a way. 
I was looking for a place. Uh, I, uh, I forget the name. Stupid. Yeah. What you want there? Oh, a drink. I don't mind if I do. <laughs> well, fine. Let's go. Oh, yes, I remember it now. Oh, that's swell, honey. El Torero. El Toro. That's it. A joint. Strictly a dive. Oh, you know where it is? What do you want to go there for? Well, I told you. Yeah. You said a drink. What is it really? A dame? Mm, maybe. You were uh, going to buy a drink anyway. Oh, certainly. Okay, honey. Only no dame you're looking for is going to be at El Toro. Against Jack Benny, the adventures of Christopher London managed a Nielsen rating of only 6.9. Radio Daily soon reported it would be dropped in favor of the Falcon, which was moving over from Mutual. The last episode aired on April 30th, 1950. Now that I see you in the light, you know you ain't a bad-looking guy. What's your name? Smith? Yeah. Yeah, Smith. <laughs> I thought it was. I'm Babe. What'll it be, folks? Make mine a ginger bourbon. I think you can find an El Toro or its equivalent on any dockside in the world. The retreat of the happy companions in Hong Kong was another El Toro. And the sanctuary of the affectionate friends in Shanghai was another. El Toro. A small, dark place within the sound of the sea, where men speak in low voices to each other of their plans and schemes to catch fortune by the tail. In the small, dark place, there were seven or eight seafaring men, a couple of women sitting together, quietly, waiting, I think, for something that would never come. Well, there was a piano player, a bartender, and a waiter, and babe and me. At another time, perhaps El Toro would have been raucous with the sounds of fighting and of laughter, but tonight... Well, tonight it was brooding in the fog, waiting. Hey, babe, I've been looking all over for you. You found me. Uh, Mr. Smith, this is Gus. Say hello to the man, Gus. Hello, hello. Hello, Gus. Who asked you to sit down? My feet hurt. Just make port, Gus? I'm Mary Maloney. Mm. Irish ship? Greek. Hmm. How long you been gone, Gus? Oh, don't you remember? I should remember how long you've been gone. i never even seen you before. Babe, listen. Get lost. I'm busy. I went up to the room before I come looking for you. I brought a case of some kind of Greek stuff. Greeks don't drink. Oh, they don't, huh? What, uh, what else did you bring? We're still married, ain't we? Who says we ain't? Yeah. I brought some perfume and stuff. Well, come on, then, you overgrown droop. Is it okay if I take a poke at Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith's a friend of mine. Oh, but, babe, I just got... Okay. Just one, though. Stand up, Mr. Smith. You're in the wrong port. It'll be a pleasure. Hey, babe. Where's my upper plate? Here, droop. Oh, that's lucky. Don't even crack. That's a nice left you got, Mr. Smith. No hard feelings. No, not at all. Then try my left. I am not one who suffers fools gladly nor accepts much brown nosing. I want talent. I want ability. And I will go to lengths to find it, and I will also go lengths to put up with it. And three new customers had arrived. 